Hi everybody and welcome again to um, NRS 296 and um, the screencast series. Now this um, screencast today is going to be on uh, what things to look for when you're critiquing an article. Okay, so we're going to uh, first of all have a look at this copyright notice. Uh, the part 5B is pretty important and then we'll move on to the articles. Okay, alright. So if we have a look at the articles, and remember, um, as I was talking to you about the other day, um, the article that we've used here today has come from, it's a free open access one that I got uh, when I just Googled Journal of um, Clinical Nursing, and this one came up. So you'll be able to go and have a look at this article uh, uh, if you're further interested, um, or to you, you know, support your study if you wanted to. Uh, we'll be looking at another um, article as well, and and again, that came from um, um, an open access article. So you'll be able to go and have a look at all those. All right. Okay. So firstly, um, some of the preliminary things you want to look at is the t you know the, before you get into the nitty gritty of the article, you want to look at the title first. So is it is it um, concise but informative? And I mean, I guess it depends on what your meaning of concise is, because some people would say this. Uh, title isn't all that concise, but it really informs you what this whole um, study is going to be about. Um, another question you might ask is, does the title give you any sort of idea about what research uh, approach is going to be used? And sometimes you'll see that written as, you know, you might have this title and then you'll have a, a colon after it that says, you know, a grounded theory study or you know or a phenomenological study or something of that nature um, you know where the the research approach is also up there in the title now we note that this this particular study doesn't have that and so that's something that you can certainly comment on in your critique and 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 give some you know Give a you know have a bit of a discussion about why you think it might be important and and that just assists readers when they come across particular articles in determining whether this is an article they want to read right now. Okay, the next area of appraisal was really the abstract, and we looked at what the abstract was the other day, and we talked about how um, the abstract really is sort of like gives you a little idea of what's in the um, article, and it should really give you quite a good idea when you read the abstract of what is this about and do I want to read the whole article? Do I want to go on and read further? Um, now, um, as I mentioned uh, in the last screencast, this particular journal has um, the abstract re ha um, with subheadings and that's really useful. So you can see aims and objectives here, background, design, methods, results, conclusion and relevance to clinical practice. Now that's all really valuable because then you can have a look at those key areas that you're particularly interested in. Um, in determining whether you, you you want to download this article and read the whole thing and print it out or whatever you're going to do, okay? So that's that's really useful. And and I think from this abstract you could make that decision because it's pretty clear um, what's going on in there. Um, you can see that the abstract. Um, gives you a background, that it tells you what the aims of the research are, to explore what fathers perceive to be facilitators or barriers to their involvement with their infants, and it goes on to um, outline the study in a little bit more detail. Um, it tells you the problem, it tells you the method, um, it tells you the design, um, it gives you the results there. Um, and it goes on to give you some conclusions and relevance to clinical practice and that's all really, really useful. And so on, on, you know, the whole of it, you would have a look at this abstract and say, yes, you know, I can make a good, I can make a decision really based on what the information is here because it's well set out and it's well written. Okay. Now, when we go down here, remember we talked the other day about um, the, word, the system called IMRAD, and that's I-M-R-A-D, which stands for Introduction, Methods, uh, Results, and Discussion. 
and this comes out of the National Standards Institute of the United States of America, which they really wanted to have a standardised way that journals would um, present information. So it's pretty easy for people to 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 be able to access this. All right. So. And remember I said to you, in some journals, introduction might also encompass the literature review. Or you might have a set, an introduction and then the literature review. In this journal, what we have is an introduction and then a background. Okay? And in this case, it introduces the, um, the topic and gives you a purpose of the study in the introduction. And then it goes on in the background to discuss the literature. Okay, so let's look at this um, introduction. Okay, so we um, goes on to talk about um, the problem at hand. Okay, so it should be discussing the purpose of the study, like why they're bothering doing it. What, what is the study investigating? Um, you know, you want to be making sure it gives the actual problem that they're looking at, um, or the question that's being that was answered. Uh, does it give? Um, any theoretical reason for why they're doing it. Sometimes what you find is that um, it's a clinical problem, they solve it, but they don't necessarily have a, a, a theoretical basis for why they may, may have done it. And, and some will and some won't, depending on the sort of study that you're having a look at. Um, the background uh, and in, sorry, the introduction should also set the study in context. Does it give um, an idea in terms of what other work has led to the question they've got right at the moment? And you can already see that they've thought about this by they've used a range of literature to have a look at. Um, you know, like many, here we go, many NICUs have adopted a family-centred approach to care whereby mothers, fathers, siblings and extended family are considered to be the recipients of care. So they're, they're, they're really outlining um, the context in which this study was undertaken. Um, you know, does it set the scope of the problem? And sometimes that will become more evident as you go on. And say down here, it's good to note, uh, where is it? It says something to the tune, particularly stressful for some fathers is the separation from their infant and their inability to comfort or hold their infant. They may feel ignored by staff. Um, and so, what they're really setting this introduction up to do is to say, okay, well, obviously there's a bit more literature about about mums and bubs in NICU, NICUs. Um, perhaps what we want to look at is dad's roles in these units um, and, and see what they perceive as being um, the facilitator and the barriers. Okay, great. Um, does, it, does the introduction talk about the importance of the, the, the study they've undertaken? And usually it will do. And say here, we can go down a bit further again. And it said, to date, only a very few studies have examined the effects of father's involvement on children requiring NICU hospitalisation. Okay. Um, and again, that the, the next sentence says, there is some beginning evidence that father's involvement in the NICU may have positive outcomes for the for, for former NICU infants. So there's some, you know, what that's telling us why this this study is important. So if we go up to the end of the introduction, what we're going to see here is thus given the evidence that father's involvement is important for the healthy development of children, it would be important to understand the factors that facilitate or impede involvement during NICU hospitalisation. Great. Gives us purpose, tells us why it's important, and then they move on to the background. Now remember I said the background um, is really the literature review and it's called background in this journal. So um, you might find that um, you have a conceptual framework in here, if it's a, particularly if it's a quantitative study, um, but um, you know, and then you might uh, you have a look at and think about, well, is an appropriate framework for the study? And, and look, at this beginning level of research um, consumer, it's probably tricky to think about, and well, how do I compare that? And you're really only going to be able to do that if you go and have a look in the in the literature to determine whether that is, you know, you know, is this a reasonable way that they've looked at this? And 
I reckon if you do a, a literature uh, search and have a look at a dozen studies in the same sort of era, you start to get a feel for um, studies that stick out a bit. And you think, oh, it seems a bit strange. I wonder why they approached it that way. And usually they'll give a reason, um, which is useful to know. OK, so... Um, you know, some of the things that you might want to look for is framework. Is it a nursing framework? Does it use another framework of some description um, when they discuss that? Uh, does it might use a sociological framework or a psychological framework? Um, and and think about, you can critically think about how that may impact upon the study itself um, and how then it becomes relevant for you in your work, okay? You want to be making sure that the, the um, concepts are pretty clearly desi desi um, defined. Sorry, um, and I guess here um, we're not seeing that so clearly here because it's been outlined a bit more in the um, introduction area of this um, article, and that's fine too. What we're seeing is the literature being um, so we're building in this. Um, Article. We've built the case in the introduction for why the study needs to be undertaken um, with literature, and then we are further discussing why this particular study is is really important here. So, um, okay, let's come down to the summary. Okay, so here. Um, we're summarising current evidence suggests fathers do visit their newborn but may not be involved in providing infant care. So they're really setting things up there. Right. What you also want to be looking at when you look at literature review, reviews are is that is the review comprehensive and complete? And again, you're only going to know that if you go and look at other sources. Is is uh, a mix of classic and current sources used, or are they all really old? Like, for example, you know, here we've got Sandalowski 2000, and there'd be some people who would say, oh, that's too old, you can't use that. But Sandalowski, that particular paper is really a seminal paper, and it's a classic, and it is important to be put here. Um, it's the method that this, this particular study is using. It's really um, valuable in this case, and it, it would be seen to be um, not the thing to use a much more, a, a, a more um, recent one that wasn't as good. Like Sandalowski stuff, clearly that's the, that's the bee's knees. Okay, um, is there, you want to be looking for primary sources, um, making sure that, it's, that this person hasn't just reviewed other people's literature reviews, that they've reviewed um, actual studies, like, you know, to, you know, so they're not getting second-hand information, so that's important. Um, is it an integrated review or is it just a summary of individual research publications? Um, does it look at strengths and weaknesses of the different studies with, um, you know, that's objective rather than a really biased look? Um, and does it, you know, develop logically and come to a conclusion producing an argument that justifies why you need to do this study? It's so important to do it. Um, and then you would have a look at, do, does the author really summarise um, the, the important parts of literature? And, and we can see that that has all occurred here, you know, so that's really great. Okay, so in some sorts of studies, you will have a hypothesis of, and variables that will sit in here as well um, that will be part of the method in some journals but may not be. And they will discuss, um, they will may be written in the null or null hypothesis, like there is no significant difference between, or it might be written as there is significant difference between, um, you might find them in this section here. Um, and that would suggest a proposed relationship, and that's either directional or null hypothesis. And we will talk about these hypotheses much more in the session. So don't be worried if you don't know that language right at the moment. Um, the hypotheses, when you look at them, you think, oh, how are they ever going to test them? Well, you can have a think about that, and we'll talk about that more um, as we go on. Okay, so generally, once we look at the methods, the methods or the methodology section should really give enough detail so that you can um, 
you can do this study again to replicate the study um, with the information within this paper. Um, like, I guess, for example, if it's an experiment of some description, um, the exact procedure in which the authors uh, administer the treat, treatment, um, say if it's a, you know, an experimental design, should be given so that you could go away and say, right, I'm going to set up the same study and see if I get the same results. Um, it's usually broken, this um, methodology section or method section is usually broken down into some subsections and some journals do that and some don't. Um, and there are um, the main subsections that you usually find are things like design, um, participants or subjects, uh, setting for the study, uh, procedures for data collection and analysis, and then you might get a, a section that looks at instruments, tools and materials. Okay. So the method section should really have the um, design pretty early on in the section and here we see it says a qualitative descriptive design was used to examine the barriers and facilitators to involvement. Okay, tells us right up front, great, that's what we're looking for. Um, you want to be thinking about has, has the, um, the author addressed all the sections that we just talked about just then. And given that we don't necessarily have the, um, the subheadings here, you would need to go through this prose and have a look at it in, in a bit more detail. Um, is the design really the appropriate one to ask the question? And I guess that's another hard thing for you to determine at this point, but again, further reading in both this content area and this method area will help you determine that. And if you do a, a search, um, either a Prima search or a database search on qualitative um, descriptive design, you're going to come up with a heap of stuff and you're going to find out um, what this design is about and whether this is appropriate for this um, study to be run like this. And, that, and just that further reading will give you a bit more experience in that area. Um, now, in quantitative designs, if it's an experimental design, and remember I said we talk about these things, you want to have an idea of whether the um, way of testing the hypotheses was valid. Could they really test what they set out to test? Or are they testing something different? And often you'll find in the results that there's a discussion about that. Um, do, can we see a, um, a section in here on participants or subjects? Well, we can. It, there's not, it's not got a, a subheading. But it says, fathers were recruited from a two open space design knickers. You know, and here it goes. You know, fathers were included if blah, 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 blah. You know, so, and it tells you how they got them. And that's, that's good. So you know exactly who this group of um, participants were and, and so that you can understand the, the study um, characteristics. Um, sometimes you'll see a target population being discussed, like they had a bigger lot and then they sort of got them down to the actual sample. Sometimes you will, if it is a quantitative study, um, the sample will need to be representative um, and we'll talk a lot more about that but in qualitative research that's, that's a little bit different about how that's determined and the importance of that in research anyhow. Um, what type of sample and could it, that have had the impact on the findings and you know so in here what they've done is they've excluded fathers if they've had a previous child hospitalised in their NICU uh, may affect involvement and so that's that's good that they've mentioned that um, and that tells you exactly what um, why they're being excluded all right um, it tells you the process of how they recruited the participants and that's really good. Uh, they should tell you about ethics approval and this study does. Um, some journals make have a subsection about that. So after obtaining approval from the Institutional Review Board at both sites, 
so that tells you that it's been through ethics um, and different countries and different journals require that to be written in a different way. Um, sometimes it talks about study attrition or study mortality, subject mortality, which does not mean that the people involved in this subject died. It means that they wanted to withdraw from the study and so their data was lost. Okay, So sometimes that goes in there and that's particularly important in quantitative studies, not so much important in qualitative studies. Um, you need to know that the, um, the participants were volunteers um, so this outlines how they were recruited and then hopefully they're up the top of the section. Uh, it, you know, so it doesn't say at this point that they were volunteers but it, it would normally say that they weren't, they were paid or they weren't paid. So, um, you know, I guess we would be looking at this study saying it would look like, um, that they had not been paid. Um, and I guess you would say that you could assume from this study that they were volunteers because it says first approached by a member of the clinical staff to obtain their permission for research staff to contact them about the study. Interested fathers were then contacted by research staff. So only people who said yes I'd be interested were contacted. So I think we could assume there that these these fathers were volunteers in this study. Although it's probably pretty important to note that. that that um, that you know the participants in the studies were volunteers and no payment was made, so it just gives that um, a, you know extra weight if you like. Um, it, consent should be discussed, and it certainly is. We've got verbal consent down there, and it goes on up the top here to talk about written and formed consent. Okay, so that is um, great. Then it goes on to talk about. Um, it should go on to talk about some of the issues about how they um, protect the privacy, um, confidentiality, and that sort of thing, and all, uh, anonymi uh, anonymity um, of the participants. And here, what we're seeing is by a female interviewer in a private room adjacent to the NICU with no other person's presence. Okay, so so it's about that maintaining privacy. Okay. Um, if there is an instrument used, you, it, they usually report stats related to the instrument or tool, um, so like a, a questionnaire. They, they normally report the stats around that, um, the reliability and validity, and we'll talk more about that as the session goes on. Um, sometimes I talk about uh, that there are several people that collected data and they talk about how they've um, how they've made sure that there is an inter-rater bias so that that one person doesn't doesn't think more of one thing or another than another all right okay then they should tell you what data management and processing occurred and we can see here they um, you know, interviews were audio recorded and lasted between 45 and 90 minutes. Um, they completed a demographic questionnaire. Um, they were analysed. Uh, analysis and interviews occurred concurrently. So it tells you how they did it. Transcripts of the interview were verified. Notes recorded. Um, then it goes on to talk about the data analysis software that was used called NVivo. Um, how they did there and then the codes were further examined, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's really good because it tells you, you can go off and do this study because it's, um, you know, it's in enough detail. All right, um, sometimes you might also, um, the, you know, this one also talks about uh, aspects of rigour and credibility which um, is, is a discussion you will now find much more so in qualitative research. Okay, on to the res results. Now, the results section should be clear and clearly presented and concise. And what you'll often find is that for demographics particularly that they'll have them in a table. Um, and for quantitative research you'll find tables are everywhere in the, in the results section. Um, and that just, sometimes that, uh, presenting them in a tabulated format makes it easier to, to get a hold and for readers to get a hold on what the, what the data is saying. Alright, so um, is the data sufficient and complete? Um, 
and you know we'll go on and talk about that in a minute. Uh, did the did the researcher in in this case give the answers to all the hypotheses or research questions? Well, we didn't see um, uh, we saw study purpose and not questions or hypotheses. So we don't really know until we've read the research uh, if that's the case. Okay, let's go on through that um, results section. We need to have a think about were the results significant? Now there are two different sorts of significant. One is statistically significant. So what we're talking about there is that the results could not have happened by chance. That um, that it would appear from the results that whatever you did um, was did actually have a um, an effect on this particular sample of people or. Yeah, you know, mushrooms or whatever you're looking at. But more importantly, in our circumstance, what we need to say and think about is, were they clinically significant? Because there are lots of results around that are statistically significant, but are not, and they're nonsensical, and they're of no value in the clinical area. Um, and um, that's something that you want to be thinking about, you know, that just because it's statistically significant does not mean that you can ever actually use it. Okay, so you can see here in this um, screenshot that there are some nice tables um, telling you about these 18 fathers and some of the things that are about um, these guys, you know, the, the, the demographic characteristics, there's factors involved, influencing father's involvement, then there's a um, table down further that um, infant characteristics, so um, some of these obviously are twins. Um, and you can see here, for example, here's some missing data. So there is one baby that they don't know the mode of delivery, how it was born. Okay, so um, that's um, you know that's important to understand that sometimes you do have missing data. So you know, all right, okay. Um, so the results really just discuss talk about the results and what they found, and we'll just skip on down to the discussion now. In different, you can see in different sections that it discusses. Uh, now, discussion. Okay, now the discussion really should um, discuss the findings or the results of the study and wrap up the article. So it should really bring out the important results that were found. It might um, compare and contrast to the, the rest of the literature, and you can see here that um, this study does that. So here we go, um, fathers perceive that infants' physical attributes affected their involvement. This finding is consistent with a study of Taiwanese fathers who found that fears of harming the infant prevented men from engaging in physical contact. Okay, so that, that's that um, comparison to other literature in the area. Okay, that's really, really good. Often you'll need to see uh, strengths and weaknesses. So what you might weaknesses might be um, referred to as limitations within a discussion, or you might see another section called limitations, depending on the article and the journal. Um, and that would be, you know, that would be important. Now, often um, here we go. We might see that here. One second, there's something down here. Okay. Okay, here we go. One important limitation of this study is that the interviews were conducted by a female interviewer. Okay, um, so there you go. That there's that they're talking about the limitations, and they've had to think about. They've really critically thought about. Well, what would happen if? What would the information be? They're not assuming that it will be one way or another, but they're saying it may have been different. We don't know, so it's a limitation. Okay, that's important. Um, the other thing that the discussion will go on to do is it should um, give you some uh, further ideas of the, where research can continue. Um, it might talk about how it can be generalised to other settings. And here we go, it says fathers in different settings may experience barriers and facilitators, blah, blah, blah. So it talks about that, okay? So um, that's good. It 
should go on to talk about implications for practice and you can see down here that this does go on there and talk about that. Okay, it talks about um, and effectively what they're talking about, because this is more than the results, is it gives you, so what do we need to do as nurses in, in the workplace? So it tells us how nurses can support involvement during NICU hospitalisation. So it tells us how fathers are feeling and what their perception is. It then says, so, so this is what we need to do to support them um, in caring for their baby. Um, you might go further on and gives you, you know, this one is a very nice one, um, and gives you very clear directions for future research, including the exploration of the relationship, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, that's really great. So they really tell you, oh, well, so we could follow this research team, and they're probably going to look at one of these things in, in the future. Okay. Um, and then we go on and we have a look at the research section and again, the references section, I apologise. And it tells you um, what classic and current sources they've used. Okay, so you would hope to see a mix of those. This contribution section, as I've talked to you about, um, uh, just tells you who contributed to what part of the study um, and the um, primary author, as I told you in the other screencast, is the one that is involved um, the most. It's not done alphabetically. Now, I want to have a look at this one, um, and it's just from the Clinical Nursing Research. Again, I got it free online. Um, now, I just want you to um, have a look here because this, can you see this um, abstract is quite different. So there's no subheadings. You have to read it to really determine if you want to be in reading the whole study. Okay. We can't instantly see what design they're using. Okay, we can't instantly see uh, whether they use a conceptual framework. Okay, here is the introduction, but um, as you can see, there's not a um, there's not a title for that, and that's just the journal type. It goes on to do what we know an introduction would normally do. Um, then we should, oh, there we go. Now at the back of this, so this introduction is giving us research questions and that's great. So it's building its case. We set out, and it says here, it, we set out to answer two research questions by performing a secondary analysis of data within our existing full database. And it's got the two questions. That's really good. Okay. Gives us the method. And this is using a descriptive analysis um, uh, from a three-year perspective longitudinal quasi-experimental study examining the effectiveness of post-fall index. Okay, so it's telling you what they were doing. Um, it goes on to talk a bit more about how, what they, um, ha, um, what data was collected, and who by, and those sort of things. And then this one does use subheadings in the method section, and here it is. So um, you can talk about, uh, like it's got the measure, measures extrapolated from the um, PFI, PFI, demographics, and past medical history. And again, so there's a few different sections that you can see. Okay, now the results again will have some demographic stuff in it. Now we'll probably see it, is that there's a table one, so that will give us the, there we go. There's some demographic and clinical um, characteristics. Isn't that really important to understand? Again, the discussion, it's got a table in it to, um, to discuss the, those findings a bit more in detail, and then it goes on and it, it, it really tells you about the, the study. This has got a separate limitation section um, with a subheading and it goes on and really discusses um, why this, there was limitations within this study. And then it goes on to the conclusion. Okay, now, and oh, well, here we go, we've got um, the clinical implications of the nursing home staff. Again, great. And this, this, um, has this particular section in nursing journals is really useful, I think, for nurses. Now, down the bottom here, we've got de declaration of conflicting um, interest and funding. Now, you'll find that in some journals, and some journals you won't find it. And um, but 
you know, again, there are more titles that we didn't see in the Journal of Clinical Nursing. Now, you can see these two articles are really different, both in um, the way they've gone about their study and the sort of study they've done, but you can see just the, the way that the um, the um, journal likes its information reported is also really different. So I hope this has been helpful and um, I look forward to hearing uh, what you think about it. Okay, talk to you later. Bye.